Uh, it's really a wonderful pleasure to be at this event, uh, and uh, I want to just spend the next 20 minutes giving you a flavor for what it is uh, to be a student of the mind. Uh, I have been a student of the mind really from high school. Uh, I uh, spent my Friday afternoons volunteering in a local sleep laboratory, uh, cleaning electrodes. Uh, and I had the conviction that understanding the mind was really the key to understanding um, much else about the world, uh, including the nature of happiness and uh, uh, also how we can transform the world. Because uh, if we're going to make the world a better place, we really have to start with each individual mind. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I had the uh, great pleasure and um, honor of being around a number of people. This was in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the uh, mid-70s, and it was a hotbed of all kinds of interesting activity. And uh, I, in addition to having my traditional education in William James Hall, uh, I kind of was able to uh, garner an alternative education, which was happening uh, in various people's homes, um, one of whom was a guy by the name of John Kabat-Zinn, who subsequently went on to develop mindfulness-based stress reduction and is the author of a number of um, well-known popular books, including Full Catastrophe Living and Wherever You Go, There You Are. Um, Dan Goleman, the author of Emotional Intelligence, was around at that time. Uh, some of you may know the name of Ram Dass, uh, who was a spiritual teacher. Uh, former Richard Alpert, who is a professor of psychology at Harvard. Uh, and Ram Dass was around Cambridge at that time uh, and uh, also uh, became a very close friend and teacher. And so uh, here I was learning traditional science and also having uh, an alternative education. And one of the uh, um, uh, things that I glean from this alternative education is that the way that the, that Western philosophy and psychology has defined the mind uh, as mostly a repository of kind of fixed characteristics was really thought of very differently in other cultures and traditions. And in the middle of my graduate career, I felt sufficiently compelled uh, to learn more about this that I went off to India and Sri Lanka and spent three months um, away from graduate school, uh, getting my first taste of what these other traditions had to provide from the inside. And it convinced me that an integrated epistemology that combined our first person experience with scientific methods was not only possible, but was really required in order for us to have a complete understanding of the mind. Uh, and I was led to a number of um, uh, of conjectures at that time, which are the conjectures that still motivate the work that I do, and I'll share them with you uh, in the few minutes that we have. Um, so, uh, this works very variably, I understand. Um, so, one of the central conjectures is that well-being, to some extent health, and other kinds of positive characteristics are best thought of as the product of skills that can be enhanced through training. Now, we normally don't think of happiness as a skill. And if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this talk is that happiness is indeed a skill from everything we now know in Western neuroscience as well as coming from the contemplative traditions uh, and other associated characteristics like well-being. Um, in the uh, written remarks, you'll see that I, I wrote a little bit about the, the growing awareness of interdependence as a direct experiential consequence of um, things that we can do to train our minds so that we can actually be more closely in touch with the environment around us, which may, in fact, lead to um, certain kinds of social and political change, which we heard many of the speakers in the first session talk about the need to occur. Um, 
One of the critical issues for us in a university setting and for education more generally is the coexistence of compassion and criticality. Uh, and there are some skeptics, I think, who um, tell us that uh, in order to be critical, you can't be kind. And I would like to just um, uh, invite you to consider that that kind of dogma is just bogus. Uh, and that we actually can be both critical and kind at the same time, but it requires training. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about implications for public education. So um, this idea that compassion, happiness, and other positive characteristics are all best thought of as the product of skills that can be enhanced through training, to some extent, was something that I have learned a lot about uh, in the last 15 years through my relationship with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And um, some of you know this story, but in 1992 I was contacted by his office. He was interested in uh, having neuroscientists more seriously investigate the possibility that Individuals who spent years training their mind may in fact have alterations in brain function and structure that have arisen as a consequence of their mental training. And he was interested in encouraging, in encouraging scientific research on these questions. And he invited me to come meet with him at his residence in Dharamsala, India. And um, that meeting that I had with him in 1992 changed the course of my life and it changed the course of my career. I had been interested in this kind of work from very early on, but it was very much in the closet, very much under the rug. And I made a commitment to him on that day that I was gonna come out of the closet. Uh, and I was gonna talk about publicly the importance of this area, and I was gonna do everything I could to put compassion on the scientific map. Uh, I think it's fair to say that if you look at textbooks of psychology or neuroscience, uh, in the mid-1990s, not a single one of those books has the word compassion in the index. And as a student of the mind, knowing that a quality like compassion is so important to our human repertoire, the failure to include compassion in textbooks of psychology and neuroscience is nothing short of scandalous. And I think that we need to just elevate the status of the, of research on these qualities and the promotion of these qualities in a much more systematic way. And that is something that I told His Holiness on that day that I was going to do everything I could to help promote. And um, one of the cool things is that there have been tremendous changes in science that have enabled this to occur uh, in a way which was unimaginable even 10 years ago. And I want to just list a few of those things. The first is this idea of neuroplasticity. The greatest contribution of modern neuroscience is the detailed understanding of the mechanisms by which the brain changes in response to experience and changes in response to training. The brain is the key organ which uh, changes in response to training and experience. And the confluence of this idea of neuroplasticity with the contemplative traditions which provide a technology for how to change the mind enables this work, I think, to go forward on a scientific footing which a decade ago was unprecedented. Um, the second, if I can get this to move on, um, maybe someone back there can help advance. Uh, the, the second, uh, issue is epigenetics. Uh, and epigenetics refers to the idea uh, that the regulation of our genes um, occurs. Uh, we are all born with a fixed complement of DNA, but the extent to which genes are turned on and turned off very much depends upon environmental circumstances. And also it depends upon our own mental qualities and our behavioral repertoire. And there's increasing evidence to suggest that that's the case. Uh, and this leads to the possibility 
that through training our mind, we can actually influence the expression of our genes. The third idea is what I've called neurally inspired behavioral interventions. The best way to change the brain with specificity is not through drugs. It is through what we can do with our behavior and our lifestyle. Because when you administer a medication that affects the brain, it is a blunt instrument that affects receptor systems that are very widely distributed. But if we want to achieve a more specific effect, we can achieve that kind of specific effect through behavioral training. And finally, this idea of putting the brain back into biomedicine, which is a way to put the mind back in, we know today that many of the major diseases which exact a very significant burden on our culture, uh, diseases where uh, we know, for example, there's a, a big socioeconomic gradient in the incidence of those diseases, cardiovascular diseases, asthma is another one, there's incontrovertible evidence that psychosocial factors play a role in modulating the course of the illness. The question is, if psychosocial factors modulate the course of the illness, they've got to get under the skin in some way. They get under the skin by being transduced by the brain. And so if we can change the brain, we potentially can change the course of those illnesses. So, this is a photograph which was taken in 2001, uh, one of the several occasions when the Dalai Lama came to visit our lab. Uh, and um, he has been deeply interested in the possibility of investigating, using modern neuroscientific methods, compassion. And this is the, the um, challenge that we first took on, and we brought individuals who we called very long-term practitioners. These are individuals who've spent a minimum of 10,000 hours training their mind. We brought them to Madison. Most of these people live in Asia, and we've investigated, and this, this study goes on still today. Um, uh, and in fact, someone just introduced himself to me, who is uh, uh, someone from Boulder, Colorado, who's flown in in one of our studies, uh, and he's been participating uh, and uh, he was told about this event um, by someone on campus, and so he is here with us today. Um, so we've started with looking at how the brain changes when, when we do um, these practices to cultivate compassion, and um, how much more time do I have? Was that time? No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so... Um, uh, there are, th this is the wor in the words of one of these long-term practitioners. He said, what we have tried to do for the sake of the experiment is to generate a state in which love and compassion permeate the whole mind with no other consideration, reasoning, or discursive thoughts. And this is something that these experts are able to do, and we can investigate how the brain changes when they're engaged in these kinds of, um, of practices, something that is difficult for uh, I think most of us, because our minds are just not that focused. Um, uh, uh, our minds, uh, as we heard from uh, uh, Mihalai earlier the, today, uh, are uh, very much um, scattered, chaotic, and uh, as, as some say in this tradition, they, we have qualities of monkey mind. Our minds just jump around from one thing to another. This is one of our long-term practitioners who is just coming out of the MRI scanner. And this is a guy who's played a very key role in our work. His name is Mathieu Ricard. He's a well-known author. Um, uh, he's written a number of popular books that have been translated into English. And he's been a Buddhist monk since 1967, but he also has a PhD in molecular biology, where uh, he, he received it from the Pasteur Institute, where he worked with Francois Jacob the Nobel laureate. Uh, so he comes with very unusual credentials and an ability to bridge these um, different cultural worlds. And this is um, just a slide to show that in our early work, this was a paper that was published in 2004 with brain electrical measurements, just showing the difference from a resting state to the meditation state where these practitioners are um, generating a state in which love and compassion permeate their whole mind, and you don't need fancy signal processing to see that there's a big difference in the brain. 
And um, this was our initial discovery that when these individuals are engaged in these purely mental practices, something dramatic happens in the brain that actually is quite easy to see. Now, one of the things that we've been led to is to ask whether really short-term training could make a difference. And I won't go through this in detail because of lack of time. Uh, and um, so, pardon me if I skip over a couple of slides, but we have, I'll summarize it for you, we have recently completed a study uh, where we've asked whether just two weeks of training could make a difference where people are practicing just 30 minutes a day. Moreover, they're doing the practice in the privacy of their own homes and they're getting the training over the internet. And the bottom line is that after just two weeks of training for 30 minutes a day, your behavior changes and your brain changes. And your behavior changes in a way where you are demonstrably more altruistic. Now just think, if we can change our behavior in our brains with just 30 minutes a day of training, what would the world look like if more of us did that in a more systematic way? And I'm going to skip this uh, in the interest of time. We'll talk about it more tomorrow. But this just shows that after two weeks of training, um, there is a big difference between a group given compassion training and a group given another kind of training in um, how altruistic or pro-social they are on a very rigorous behavioral measure. Another quality which we don't often think about as something that can be educated is attention. And I want to read this quote. Um, this comes from a two-volume tome that was written by William James in 1890 in his chapter on attention where he said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. No one is compost sui if he have it not. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. But it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. Now, I think that if William James had more contact with these contemplative traditions, he would instantaneously have recognized that here we have methods for educating attention which can stabilize the mind, decrease our scattered nature, and allow us to focus, allow us to have flow 24-7. That's what this is about. Now, it doesn't just change the mind, it also changes the body. After two months of training, people actually show an enhanced response to influenza vaccine. Uh, so this is not just something that affects one's feelings and the brain. These effects um, actually influence the body in ways that may be important for health. So what can we envision in the future going forward? Um, mental exercise, I think, in the future will be accepted and practiced in the same way as physical exercise is today. We will have a science in the future of virtuous qualities and we'll incorporate the mind back into medicine. Uh, and this will allow us uh, to uh, take more responsibility for our own health by changing the mind in ways that can impact the brain in, in healthy um, directions. Uh, I also think that we'll be able to uh, develop a secular approach that will provide methods and practices from the contemplative traditions that can teach teachers and children better ways to regulate their emotion and attention and cultivate qualities like kindness and compassion. Uh, we'll be able to increase awareness of interdependence, which will enable us, I think, to be more responsible stewards of the planet. And finally, uh, I think this will enable us to promote in a more widespread way these virtuous qualities which will, I think, have a beneficial impact on public discourse in promoting qualities like humility and gratitude and civility. Um, so uh, I'm going to actually skip this in the interests of, uh, of time since we're really running out of time. Uh, and I want to just end, if I can uh, go to my last slide. Um, uh, this is uh, a quote which comes from um, 
a book that was on the bestseller list for some time, and it was written by the Dalai Lama. And uh, this really captures the essence of uh, the message that I hope to convey, where he said the systematic training of the mind, the cultivation of happiness, the genuine inner transformation by deliberately selecting and focusing on positive mental states and challenging negative mental states is possible because of the very structure and function of the brain. But the wiring in our brains is not static, not irrevocably fixed. Our brains are also adaptable. Thank you.